created in 2002 initially as Zambia Interparty Bureau, then Zambia Center for Interparty Dialogue ZCID, in 2006. It has been well known for propagating peace, dialogue and unity in the country. Notable among its great achievements from its core mandate such as contribution to having free and fair 2006 tripartite elections, the development of the political party's code of conduct now part of the Electoral Act and the hosting of the first ever Summit of Presidents in 2008, ZCID has continued further engaging stakeholders for the sake of a peaceful Zambia. Recently, ZCID engaged eminent persons, senior citizens and institutions for their endorsement of the center's quest to bring harmony in the country through dialogue. Among those met were the first and fourth Republican presidents, their excellences David Kenneth Kaunda and Rupia Bwezani Banda, respectively, the church and others. ZCID further went to hold the second National Democracy Stakeholders Summit, NDSS, in Lusaka in May 2018. Another meeting for Forum for Political Parties, that is, those political parties without representation in parliament. And about a month later, the parent peace and dialogue entity in the country organized party secretary general's meeting in Siavonga on 11th and 12th June. The meeting attracted attendance from all political parties with and without members in parliament and eminent persons. The Secretary General's meeting was mainly to discuss and consolidate the resolutions from the NDSS as well as set up the agenda for Summit of Presidents. Before the main agenda could be touched, Center's Executive Director Monica Kajimana and Board Chairperson Nathan Mulonga through Board Member Jackson Slavwe welcomed the delegates. May I wish you a fruitful deliberations as we try to coin an agenda for the Summit of Political Party Presidents and indeed build consensus on issues that affect all of us here. May God give us the wisdom to be able to come to decisions that will impact the nation and benefit our Zambians. That this meeting has been convened to allow the distinguished delegates arrive at consensus on a number of aspects regarding our nation, in particular, the dialogue process. Number one, we must formulate a plan of action reflecting commitments on how to bring our presidents to the summit of presidents. Number two, we must also coin a far-reaching agenda reflecting issues for discussion by the Summit of Presidents. Number three, further, we have to agree on a suite of conveners and chairpersons for the Summit. Number four, this meeting must come up with indicative dates on which the summit of presidents can be held. However, before the meeting could go with a set agenda, delegates questioned the rationale of the opposition United Party for National Development, UPND, not being represented by its secretary general, or indeed the deputy, as only proxies were sent for the meeting. Some political parties are not presented by Secretary General. We are concerned. When we finish this summit, we expect all of us to move together and say, yes, this is what we agreed. If others will say we didn't attend, then it becomes a problem. Yes. There is a risk, Council, Dr. Bayan and general. There's no risk. No. I just want me to learn. I'm just telling you there's no risk. A risk of having a situation where because you have created a bureaucracy of two, three stages, having to have you possibly denounced by your party, 
because you are a junior officer, and this we have seen in political you know, arrangements. It's actually disheartening for us. Certain colleagues in our organization have decided to send proxies. Even out of this last late last night, we are being assured that their presence will be registered here. And at no time prior where we communicated to that we are going to send proxies. I will not take a decision that the party will disagree with. If I disagree with the decision of this meeting, I will state, you, state it clearly that on this position, UPAD distances itself in this meeting. And the party will back me. That I give you my word. Having heard the submission by our colleagues from the UPND, can they at least be magnanimous enough to tell us what has happened to the Secretary General? But the UPND defended its position. And we agreed in advance on the position we need to take on the various respective issues. So I carry the weight and the mantle of the Secretary General of the UPND. The decision I will make here represents the decision and the weight of the Secretary General of the UPND. Presentation of thematic submissions and resolutions from the NDSS and FPP meetings were done to set the tone for deliberations by the delegates. The thematic areas mainly looked at were electoral, constitutional and institutional reforms, separation of powers and judicial independence, tolerance and freedom of assembly and civility in politics. Uh, heads of gov good governance institutions are appointed by the president, but he or she should not have the power to disappoint them. That was a recommendation that was made so that these other ways of government are strengthened. The other recommendation was that there should be security of tenure for these officers that are appointed by the president. The meeting then progressed with key issues from the NDSS and FPP being raised. Among the issues raised were the operationalization of the provincial assemblies. This matter has been coming the past 30 years and no government has implemented this, one, this issue because there is a cost implication. Because when you establish provincial assemblies, in, in short, you are establishing parliaments in provinces. No any government will implement this matter. The inclusion of provincial assemblies in the constitution, we must zero in to what we want to achieve. And that is representation, decentralization, the people being able to make decisions on how to lead the provinces and how to locate resources as well. Yes, it is expensive, but anything worthwhile indeed is expensive. So I submit that no matter how expensive it is, we must subscribe to it. Uh, I think it's time this provision was tabled to the stakeholders and, and visited again. Provincial assemblies should uh, uh, be operationalized. I think it's time we move towards that direction. Uh, maybe the talk was being economical with uh, what you wanted to say. This is the way we are going to solve the Balose issue. And it, will be, and it will sit very well for us to do if we brought in and operationalized the provincial assemblies. And that will also maintain Zambia as a unitary state. Electoral system changing to proportional representation. The PR system addresses many, many problems we are facing here. It does away with these costly and useless violations. And it, 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 it makes the council rest. After election, you deal with the developmental discourses. And you wait for the next election. Then we are at least addressing the issues of fiscal consolidation in the long term. Because this will cater for the, for the end of us, women also to participate in these elections. 
Because as we asked it, I was ready to point it out. Even the parents won't be there. Because we are tired of being kicked. You know, these gentlemen, when they say that they are losing, they bring all sorts of tactics to win the elections. So they kick us around, they abuse us. So with the proportional representation, we shall participate in this uh, uh, our political partisan for countries we have free and fair. Adoption of the Constitution through the People's Assembly and the President appointing ministers outside Parliament. The late President Michael Sasha, I told you before he died that, you know, we are copying and test the Constitution from Kenya, which we have done, and <laughs> I'm not shy to say that. This appointment of ministers outside Parliament has brought problems, and in fact, they want to change. And I support it if he has withdrawn to have both so that they have a choice from Parliament and from outside. That's my opinion. When you are appointed minister, you basically functionally cease to be an MP. That constitutes no longer as an MP. Because an MP, if a, the MP for Siahonga is a minister, you can't stand up and say, the government is not waiting on my bridge, just sit down. You can't attack your own government. Like and also, it has brought many problems in Parliament. Basically, half of parliament becomes executive. So basically, in Zambia, we have no parliament. Constituents will suffer. They cannot criticize this government on issues which are very right. So I believe that the only way to go in order to make the executive accountable is to separate uh, the appointment of the minister from parliament so that parliament can continue with the, its oversight uh, role. For instance, when you look at what's happening in Chongwe, the member of parliament of Chongwe is currently on the copper belt. So Chongwe is suffering and people were crying for representation. It's for that reason that they said they wanted uh, ministers appointed from outside parliament so that parliamentarians can then be available all the time you know, to champion the development program. Another matter of concern was the time given for presidential petition. Even the 30 days, just like the 14 days, who actually end up being <laughs> very short a time. Because people are uh, applying themselves to preliminary issues other than the substantive matter. Um, for me, if it were all up to me, I would have maintained the 14 days. But uh, considering that every person has the right to litigation and uh, we respect people's rights, uh, 30 days is more than enough because uh, if I'm disputing something, I must have evidence. Remember that you alleges must prove. So 30 days is enough for one to have had enough evidence to dispute. Therefore, we still maintain that uh, the 30 days is enough time. How long did it take for the presidential election to be held in Kenya? It was 14 days, it was notified, they went back to an election. But the problem we have in Zambia, we don't have a political will. I want, me as Mumbipiri, what I want, the absolute, everybody should follow. I think 13 day, 30 days, for me, it's enough. And In our considered view, there must be a clear distinction between the time for submission of the petition, which should be no less than 14 days, in line with the parliamentary um, uh, provisions uh, for petition and parliamentary uh, elections. And then thereafter there must be the additional 30 days in which the constitutional court, or whatever court as the case may be, will determine the petition. Otherwise it becomes an academic exercise. You find a situation where the mischief that the constitution intends um, to resolve is not resolved. There is no way we, we handle this. Anybody will tell you who's handled matters of this nature, myself included, that you cannot have a presidential petition heard and determined within this 21-day period effectively because the other seven days are for handing over. Here we are talking about the seven days. You expect anything to happen in between because there's no president. So if you increase the number of days from 30 to 45 days, and I think it will not help us. It's better that uh, we maintain the 30 days. I would like to ensure that uh, 
we maintain the same proposed 30 days. I think it's, it is adequate. One heated issue was on who leads the national dialogue between the church and ZCID and all had a fair share in debating that matter. So ZCID will be involved. It's a question of what role will ZCID play? Of course in terms of secretariat, as secretariat there's no question about it. No one can provide a secretariat for another forum. It doesn't happen anywhere. So as to who leads, I don't like the way they did. Maybe we must be talking about who must chair. If, I have no problem. If you say that uh, the church will chair, we have no problem with that one. So maybe we must change the terminology from leading to chair under the auspices of the CID Secretariat. But that is front of the CID. It doesn't have the capacity, it doesn't have the skill, it doesn't have the manpower requisite to handle such a sensitive and a critical national issue. It's very disheartening, my dear brother, for us as political parties to discredit the ZCID, which you as a political party, UPND, chaired for seven years. You didn't see these loopholes? We knew. But why were you not saying them then? They are not there at that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on, you know. The UPND is opposed to the CID leading the dialogue process. We had a meeting at our at office where we actually agreed that we are not opposed to ZCID playing the secretariat role, the role of logistics, convening meetings, but the leadership, since we don't like Commonwealth, which was the original position, and you want a local driven initiative, must go to the church and other bodies. We were very clear. That remains our position. We have not changed the goalpost. Some have talked about the Commonwealth, now it's the church. They are changing corpus, which means they are not ready. Us, Mr. Madrid, we are ready. So these are the provisions of the trust deed. So therefore, the question of whether ZCID should just come along as a participant does not even arise, it shouldn't even arise, because ZCID is just executing its mandate, and it will stick to executing its mandate by convening all these meetings around dialogue. Uh, I would like to submit that uh, ZCID should facilitate the process of dialogue in conjunction with local stakeholders and uh, we give the chairmanship as the trust deed uh, stipulates to the church. We are not discussing the trust deed and what that cannot be compromised. As Secretary General, there is a proposal from the NDSS that the church plays a role. And the definition of that role is reconciliation. Do we think that is uh, um, uh, an up, um, is it appropriate or the right thing to do? And as MMD, we have come here with a position that the church must play that role of reconciliation. Yes, we even raise the question, when you are saying that the church should be able to take reconciliation, reconciliate whom? Someone has been injured and we need to forgive each other. Our view is that reconciliation is not a critical part of the game. It will happen as a product. The delegates finally reached a conclusion that both the church and ZCID will lead the national dialogue and reconciliation, with the church chairing while ZCID facilitating. When it comes to that, we have said the church can chair. That is, that is the PF position. ZCID should facilitate those meetings for the church to come in and chair the dialogue process. That's what we have said. Very clear. As we are not scared of this dialogue, it is impossible to put away the CID 
Putting out the CID is saying the parties cannot meet. So this is a secretariat, but inviting whoever will agree here to chair the meeting. I can give you examples. In Namibia, the constitution was negotiated under the chairperson of a SWAPO member, the current president, Hange Genko. In South Africa, the one who headed the constitution, the constituent assembly, is the current president, Cyril Ramaphosa. You need a neutral arbitrator, and for us, the neutral body is the church. In ZCIT, we have different common interests. We are conflicted among ourselves. We can't leave each other. Like you're fighting with your wife, you get a family, family member to intervene. What is in the interest of ZCIT and those who support ZCIT in pursuing an agenda when we can solve this problem by letting the church lead, let ZCIT play its role as well? You know, uh, suggested secretariat, logistics, COVID meetings, and then, you know. The media was not left out during the meeting as delegates put up their thoughts. By the public media is highly politicized and it's, it, it, it predates previous governments in the practice. Public and the private media must be accountable to parliament because you have uh, the public media focusing on one angle, equally the private media. And also the private media, we know that they are actually in the, the majority and the dotted almost in every community and so forth. So it is clear that here, uh, if we need the fairness of coverage, we should have uh, a clear balance of both, a, a, check, a, a critical check on both public and the private. Accountable to Parliament how? Is there a mechanism for media to account to Parliament how? So, for me, my suggestion is that uh, we put a general statement that the media, both private and the public, should be responsible and accountable as will be provided by subsidiary legislation, not in the, the Parliament law is to deal with the IBA yes. uh, to make sure that the IBA, first of all, the, the structure of it maybe can be looked at and also give it uh, teeth uh, to bite. It. It's not just the, the, the public media that requires regulation, uh, it's media generally uh, and probably the legal framework is what we need to do. Day two began with submissions from the NDSS and FPP on the Public Order Act. When we presented uh, the paper from ZCIT to the Minister of Justice, this is one of the things which he mentioned that they've been calling as a ministry upon all stakeholders to go and submit what they think should be changed in the Public Order Act. And the minister told us that there is nobody who has ever gone to submit. So uh, what do we want? Should we sit when we have a forum, then we start shouting? When we are called to submit, we are not ready. So it should also be upon ourselves to get committed if we want these things to be changed. So I think if this is going to be upscaled to the level of the president's uh, meeting, I think it should be much more in terms of how can the public order act being crafted in such a way that it facilitates for political parties to exercise their rights to assembly, expression, and attendant events that come with that. Thank you. Clearly, we have a lopsided way of implementing the Public Order Act. Uh, in the first place, when, when you're in government, you think it's perfect. But we should look into the future and know that tomorrow you may not be where you are and try to make things right. But if the ruling party has a, has a meeting and there's a, there are, you know, some people are causing a disturbance, our police have a tendency to look the other way. And that's not fair. This Public Order Act, when I say it, it's all about it. There's nothing bad about it but it is implementation 
of an institution and sometimes individuals is about to cure certain activities and it protects it. There are some people that are going for public order act and the property. Let's just look at it. how can we manage it as an institution, not as a, an act itself. The political party bill was also discussed. At the close of day one, ZCID had requested that each political party present four core issues which they felt were critical to the national dialogue process. And on day two, they were shared during the session. The UPND had their at first, then the MMD, the FDD, and the Patriotic Front while those from the Forum of Political Parties could not, as not all members were present during the meeting. It was now time for resolutions to be made from the two-day meeting for party secretary generals. Among the key seven issues agreed on were that ZCID and the church mother bodies lead the national dialogue have the key thematic areas considered at the Summit of Presidents, form a technical committee comprising of legal representatives from political parties, and ZCID to immediately meet the church to set their program for the national dialogue process.